Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org. Turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. The kids sound kind of docile today. It's very surprising. Is that my mic or something else? You hear the ringing? I just want to make sure it's not me. If it's not me, it's okay. All right, Hebrews chapter 11, and I'm just going to start with reading verse 1, and we'll move through this. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I want to talk about faith today. Uh, maybe it's inspiration from James because that's where we're at in our Bible study right now. But it has been on my heart for several months. I've just been looking for the right time to be able to talk about it. I want to talk about faith, what it is, why it's important. And I might say some things that you haven't thought of today. I want you to give me the benefit of the doubt that I did pursue the Lord's heart about this. And instead of just maybe getting offended immediately or disagreeing, I don't think I'm going to say anything offensive, but I've thought that before. Um, I, I do want to talk about faith, though. I want to focus on faith. But I want to do it correctly. I want to teach faith correctly because the tendency I feel that sermons have when they teach, some, when they teach faith, the tendency... I think, is to focus on the things that faith has power over rather than just focusing on what faith is. So the most common one is like faith over fear. You've heard that one before. Sermons that talk about faith over fear, it's like 40 minutes of fear and five minutes of faith. 40 minutes of why you shouldn't be afraid, how fear isn't a good thing how fear will lead you astray, how fear is the opposite of what God wants for you, and five minutes of faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Today, I wanna just focus on what faith is, like what it really is. I don't wanna focus on the things that faith really can get rid of, because here's the deal. Having faith does not remove distractions, The distractions are still going to be there. The things that will make you afraid are still going to be there. The things that want to stress you out are still going to be there. The things that are want to fill you with doubt are still going to be there. The things that want to worry you are still going to be there. Faith does not remove distractions. It just gives you a different thing to focus on. Are you with me? So because of that, I want to focus on faith because if you, if you even think of fear, you cannot be afraid and still not have faith. You cannot be afraid and still not have faith. You cannot worry and still not have faith. You cannot doubt and still not have faith. Are you with me? Okay. <clears throat> so what is faith? Well, we just read... In verse one here, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. What does that even mean? You ever thought about what that really means? You just quote it, like we know that verse. It's a famous verse, we quote it. Or have you really dwelt on what that actually means? I think that we can really get to the heart of what it means if we talk first about the difference between faith and belief. Okay, I want to talk about the difference between faith and belief. Because 
even though the word uses the words belief and faith interchangeably, they are still two different things. Belief and faith are not the same thing, okay? I want us to know that. Belief and faith are not the same thing. Belief really is something that happens in the mind. It's an intellectual thing, okay? Belief, if I believe something or if I believe in something or someone, then that means that I believe that that is a fact. I believe that it is real. I believe that it exists, right? But that's not the same thing as having faith, okay? Belief and faith are two different things. I believe that George Washington once walked the face of the earth, but I don't have faith in George Washington, okay? I believe, I believe that there are diet plans out there, (laughs) but I don't always have faith in them, (laughs) right? I believe that eating vegetables is good for you, but maybe I don't have faith in eating vegetables, okay? Are you with me? This helps explain the difference between belief and faith. So belief is when we have the knowledge of something. It's when we know something to be true. It's when we know that something is real. It's when we know something that is a fact. I think that the reason I wanted to talk about this today is because sometimes when we're praying, we think that the answer is, I just need to believe more. I just need to believe more. But you can't believe more than believing. If you believe, you believe. You don't need to believe more, right? Like, I believe that that chair exists. I don't need to believe more that it exists. It's I believe that it exists, right? So whenever we're praying and we're believing for someone to be healed, it's not we're like, believing in the healing or believing that God can heal, it's, it's different. It, or believing that God has the capability or the power to heal, it's different than that. God doesn't we'll just want our belief. He wants our faith. And it's a bigger thing. And, and right now, I know some of you are, look, really, you have confused looks on your faith, because on your faith. <laughs> You've got confused look on your faith. <laughs> you have confused looks on your face because you're going, aren't faith and belief the same thing? What are you talking about, God doesn't just want my belief, he wants my faith. I wanna get into that, but I wanna make a point first that belief is only part of the process. It's only a a piece of the puzzle. It's only a portion of the whole process. The word tells us that faith makes prayer effective. The word emphasizes that. The word emphasizes that faith is actually what makes prayer effective effective. <laughs> if, you, if you look, you know, read the Gospels or read the times that Jesus dealt with his disciples, he deals with faith in them so much. He addresses their faith so much, right? He says, where is your faith? He says, you have little faith. He says, you, you couldn't because of the littleness of your faith. He's always addressing their faith. It's, it's more often than not his, their, their faith that he addresses than their belief, right? And there's a reason for that. Now, look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse one again. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. If belief is not faith and faith is not belief, what is faith? When this says faith is the assurance, everyone say assurance, When faith is the assurance of things hoped for, this word assurance means trust. It means confidence. It means confidence. It means firm trust. This word assurance. Trust is much more than an intellectual thing. It's much more than something that takes place up here. Trust is surrender. It's commitment, right? Trust really is giving up. And I don't mean giving up in the, in, in the way of I quit because I'm gonna talk quite a bit about I believe that there needs to be fervency in our prayer. The word says the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So I know that there needs to be fervency in our prayer. We need to push in our prayer, but it is not belief, more belief that we need. It is more faith. 
all right? We need not just more faith, but bigger faith. But faith really is surrender. It's laying down. It's giving up because that is what it says. It says faith is trust. Faith is assurance, right? Faith is trust. So I'm giving myself over to someone or to something. It's not just believing that that person exists. It's not just believing that God exists. It's giving myself to him. That is faith. This is how we are saved by grace through faith. So we're saved by grace. Grace is what saves us, but our trust and our commitment to God and our surrender to God is what opens the door for his grace to come in and save us. Are you with me? So faith is trust. Everyone say faith is trust. So I don't, I don't mean quitting, though. I don't mean quitting when I say giving up. I mean allowing whatever you are trusting or whoever you are trusting to support you, to come under you. And in fact, this word assurance comes from two Greek words, stand and under. So when you give yourself to God, you are saying come under me, not in a way of ranking, but I want you to be my foundation. I trust you, like, like I trust this ground that we're walking on today. I trust this ground to support me. If I didn't trust this ground to support me, I would try to fly. I would try to stay off the ground, like my, my daughter thinks that the ground is lava and she'll try to stay off the ground. But I know this ground's gonna support me and that's why I just walk on it without thinking about it. Now, I'm not saying walk all over Jesus, <laughs> but this is, what, this is a good picture of what it means to fully commit yourself to God or to trust him with everything. It's like, I'm going to just, I, I know that I can stand. I know that I can trust God to the point that I'm just gonna continue, thank you. I'm gonna continue to walk and I'm not going to worry about stumbling or falling or worry like the foundation is gonna give out beneath me. I know that he can support me. Are you with me? So faith is allowing someone, in this case, it'd be allowing God to stand under you, to be your support and your foundation. And this comes even more into play when we understand the meaning of the next word that I want to look at, which is conviction. Some translations say evidence, and they're really the same thing. But it says faith is the assurance, the trust of things hoped for. And another thing about assurance, it means I believe it's guaranteed, right? I fully trust it. I believe it's guaranteed. It's the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction. Everyone say conviction. Conviction of things not seen. This word conviction actually means test. It means proof, which is why we get the word evidence. But it's not evidence in the way of necessarily, you know, you think of evidence, you think of like the courtroom where they're providing evidence to prove something. It's, it's evidence in the way of it's been tested, so I know it to be true. It's been tested, so it's reality. I've tested, it'd be like, I believe that that chair exists, but I don't trust it until I test it. Are you with me? I believe that chair exists, but I don't trust it until I test it. I can walk out of here believing that that chair exists, but I won't know if it's gonna hold me up till I sit down in it. So faith is not just believing God is my provider. It's not just believing God is my healer. It's allowing him the opportunity to do those things. It's trusting him to provide. It's trusting him to heal. Oh yeah, I know God is, God is my healer. People say that and then go home and they don't believe that he can heal. They don't trust that he can heal. They don't give him opportunities to heal. I believe God's my healer. I, I never pray. I never ask him to heal me. I never give him an opportunity to heal me. I just go to the doctor first, but I believe. Well, that's great that you believe. I'm gonna hit on something that really heavy at the end of the sermon today and you'll, you'll understand more what I'm getting at. But it's just not enough to just believe. You have to also trust. You have to also have faith. I brought this up on Wednesday, but when the reason it's called faith when you commit yourself to the Lord, you give your life to the Lord, is because you cannot see God 
and yet you committed yourself to him. He's invisible, and yet you chose to trust him with, not just with your life, but with leading you. You've decided to trust him with being in charge. I trust you with being God, because you didn't just ask Jesus to be your savior, you asked him to be your Lord. So you're not just trusting him with your life, uh, you know, away from death, escaping death, you're trusting him with your life ahead too, to lead me, to lead you. So the very fact that you committed your life to Jesus is, that's why it's called faith, because you've decided I'm gonna trust Jesus. But that's also why James tells us that faith without works is dead. Because part of faith is not just believing and trusting God, but is trusting him and not, not testing him in the way putting God to the test, but I mean testing the things that he gives us, the things that he tells us to do. If, if God says, you know, do not murder, try it. Try not murdering and see what it does. It's good for you, right? We do this with my daughter, too. She doesn't want to eat something. We're like, you haven't even tried it. She's like, but I don't like it. You haven't even tried it. Try it, test it, and then decide. That's part of faith. And we're not testing God, okay? That's not what I'm saying. So I might... I might believe in that chair. I might believe it exists. I mean, I mean, I'm looking at it right now. You know, seeing really is believing. I believe that that chair is real, but I'm not gonna believe that it can hold me up. I'm not gonna trust it until I test it. This table, I, believe, I can feel this table right here. I know it's real, but I'm not gonna believe that it can hold my Bible until I put my Bible on it. I'm not gonna believe that it can hold me until I lean on it. Which, by the way, Proverbs says, do not lean on your own understanding. What does it say? Pro <laughs> I know it's a little play on words there. Proverbs chapter three, verse five, verses five and six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. You know that ver those verses, right? It begins with what word? Trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And then what does it say? Do not lean on your own understanding. You hear me. I don't know if you're hearing me. <laughs> trust in the Lord. The reason it says trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding is because trusting in the Lord is leaning on the Lord. <laughs> That's what it is. It means I know that if I lean on this table, I was afraid it was gonna fall, but it didn't. I know if I lean on this table, it's gonna hold me up. But the only way I know that is because I've tested it, right? Well, I don't know if God can help me out of this. Have you tried letting him? Have you tried giving him a chance? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and then do not lean on your own belief. Don't, don't trust just, a, just your belief. Don't just trust your intellect or your understanding. Right? Which, let me tell you this, if assurance, trust, is to stand under, let God stand under me, that must mean that I don't need to depend on my own understanding. Okay? I'm going to depend on him understanding, his understanding, right? Supporting me, holding me up, carrying me. So trusting in the Lord is leaning on the Lord. And I promise you, if you lean on the Lord, you are not big enough to make him fall over. Okay? You're not big enough. I think prideful people think they're too big to lean on God because they're gonna make him fall over. So they don't, right? But I love this in Proverbs 3, 6. It says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. Now that doesn't just mean like I would acknowledge that you're in the room like, hey, Nancy, Like, oh, I see God. Hey, God, what's up? I'm glad you're here today. Glad you could sit here and listen to me preach, you know? No, acknowledging him in all our ways, acknowledge means to know by experience. Not just to say, hey, what's up? I see you. It's to know by experience. In all your ways, know him by experience. This is trusting in him. This is not leaning on our own understanding. Are you with me? 
So knowing what faith really is, let me tell you, it should completely change our prayer life. Don't you think? I know I said earlier faith is giving up, it's surrender, so I'm not talking about it changing our prayer life in the way of it causing us to stop praying. Well, I just give up. I surrender, God, whatever you want. It doesn't, no. The word says pray without ceasing, right? Did you know two things can be true that sound different, right? Pray without ceasing, but surrender in your prayer. Pray without ceasing, but choose to trust him in your prayer. It's not about trying to believe more. It's about learning to trust him more. It's about learning to to give up God, I give up. I just want your way. I surrender. I feel like it should change our attitude in prayer. This feeling that we that we can somehow change things if we just believe more. But the irony is that if you are trusting God, it's not about what you can do. It's not about what I can do. It's about what he can do. Right? Trusting God is not about me gaining more power to fight back my obstacles in prayer. It's about me praying to the point that I can fully move out of the way and let God move that I can step out of the way and let him move. But it's a, it, there is still a fervency there. There's still a fight there in my prayer life. Because I'm gonna tell you, the, the things that you are going to be pushing against whenever you pray are fear and doubt. And those are the opposites of trust. Fear and doubt will stir you to take care of the problem. But trust will stir you to let God take care of it. Amen? Now let's look at Hebrews eleven six. Just You can skip down just five verses here. We know this one too. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, which could be more accurately translated to without faith, it is impossible to be pleasing to him. Without faith, it is impossible to please him or to be pleasing to him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. I don't know about your translation, but I have italics over the word and. And I think that that's really important. You guys know I'm a grammar nut. I'm a writer on the side. It's just the things that I look at, okay? I'm kind of upset that um, some translations leave out semicolons, but we won't talk about it. (laughs) without faith it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is everyone say he is what does that mean you must believe that he is it just means you need to believe that he exists (laughs) right he is he exists he's real right it's not a fairy tale as the left side would let you know or say. It's not a fairy tale, you know? It's real, God is real. So if you're gonna come to God, you must believe that he is. Here's why I think italics are over the word and in my translation anyway, the only right translation. Um, (laughs) I'm just teasing. Because whoever wrote this, the author of Hebrews, must have assumed that if somebody is coming to God, they must believe that he is already. You're not gonna come to God unless you believe that he exists, right? So I would say in writing this, it's like you you gotta believe that he is, yeah, but also (laughs) this. So I think it's already assumed, whoever wrote this, it's already assumed if you're coming to God, you believe that he is, but you also have to believe this other thing. He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. I think that that's faith. See, believing that he exists is belief. Believing that he is is belief, but believing that he is a rewarder of those who seek him is faith. Because when you come to God, you're not just coming to God because you know he exists. You're now coming to God knowing that you can rely on him to provide for you, 
really ultimately to give you himself. You are trusting him. And I, I'm, I've brought this up before. If, if you believe that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, what do you think he's gonna give you if you're seeking him? He's gonna give you himself. <laughs> if you're seeking him, he's gonna give you himself. So we have this belief that I know God is, so I'm going to come to him, but I also have to have faith that if I come to him, he's going to give me himself. Right? Are you with me? So what, what does faith do then? What does this trust do? Faith finishes the work that belief began. It took a certain amount of belief for you to even say, Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God and I believe that God raised you from the dead. I believe you died. For, it, took, it already took a certain amount of belief and you can say that in your prayer and believe everything that you're saying, but then faith will finish that work. Faith comes after that, after you say that prayer, it's this commitment, it's this surrender, it's this complete trust to God to completely lead you and to be your God, your Lord, and your Savior, your, your King for the rest of your life. That is faith. It's not the prayer. You, the prayer you said was belief, but now your life, your walk after that is your faith. Are you with me? kind of like skipping all around my notes today, so I have to figure out where I'm at. Now, what is this kind of trust going to keep, what is it gonna do for us? It's gonna cause us to keep praying, ultimately. Because what, what happens if you believe God exists, but you don't trust that he can do what he said he's gonna do? You're gonna stop praying. But if you trust that God's going to do what he said he's gonna do, you're going to keep praying. <laughs> that is faith. So faith is not, well, I give up. I prayed my prayer, that's it. Faith is I'm gonna keep praying because I know God said he can heal. I know God said he will provide. I know God said he will reward me if I diligently seek him. So I keep praying, right? So belief is not enough. Belief is not enough. Coming here on Sunday morning and learning that God can heal and walking out with the knowledge that God can heal is not enough. If you just keep going, I'm not saying don't go to the doctor, but it's not enough if your first reaction is go to the doctor, if your first reaction is get a Band-Aid, if your first reaction is you know something other than God. I'm not saying it can't be, but if, it, if that is your immediate response is I need to take care of it, then there's no faith there. There's no trust in God to take care of it. With me? All right. Before we move on to the closing here, I wanna bring up a couple of instances that just some of my favorite stories where Jesus addresses faith in the disciples so you can see what I'm talking about a little bit more. When the disciples couldn't cast the demon out of the boy and you know the father came before Jesus and he's like your disciples couldn't do this um, after after Jesus pretty much like chastises them you unbelieving and perverted generation you know how would you like if I said that to you you know you probably say oh, I don't agree with that um, no <clears throat> Jesus, you know, he chastises them, but then after that, they approach him in private. And they say, hey, why couldn't we cast the demon out? And what does Jesus say? He says, because of the littleness of your faith. Now, we might hear something like that and think, well, Josh, doesn't that just mean I need to believe more? No. I think if your faith is small, it just means you have faith in the wrong thing. You have faith, it's just small because it's in the wrong thing. If you read this story, you'll find this really interesting. If you read this story, right after they have this conversation with Jesus where he says, you couldn't cast it out because of the littleness of your faith, just a few verses later, they're arguing about who's greater. I think that's a pretty good indication of what was going on. They trusted themselves. They had faith in themselves. If they're arguing about who's greater, that means they, they thought they were something, right? 
You couldn't cast a demon out because, yeah, you had faith, but it was too small because you're small. But I'm big, he says. You place your trust in God, that is big faith. (laughs) Because not only are you placing your trust in someone you can't see, but he is big. (laughs) Right? You put your trust in yourself, in your own ability, in your own power, that is really small faith. Another thing happens with Jesus and the disciples where, you know, the disciples get in the boat with Jesus and before he goes to bed, he says, I'll see you on the other side. He goes to take a nap and the storm comes and the disciples are running around like a bunch of toddlers, you know, not really knowing what to do. They're kind of, they're scared, they're freaking out, they can't figure out what to do and so they, they run down to Jesus and they wake him up and then Eventually, after, and shortly after that, Jesus looks at them and says, uh, where's your faith? <laughs> where's your faith? Now, why did he say that? Here's, here's what I think has been, I've, I've heard this taught before, and I grew up believing this. I don't believe it anymore. I don't believe he was referring to, you don't have faith to calm the storm. I don't believe he expected them to calm the storm because we know that after Jesus calms the storm, they're going, who is this? that the wind and seas obey him. So I don't think Jesus was laying down in his bunk going, they can calm it. <laughs> they never seen, that they can control the weather. It's not a big deal. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll figure it out. They, hey, there's no way he was thinking that. He's not stupid, irresponsible, or, or um, negligent. He's not any of those things. So whenever he said, where is your faith? You know what it was? It's because the disciples, whenever they were... So in such turmoil, they couldn't figure out what to do. They ran to his bed and woke him up. And you know what they said to him? They said, are you just going to let us die? And this was the thing. They said, why don't you care? Why don't you care? Why don't, what are you, you're sitting down here napping. And then that's when he says, after that, he calms the storm. He says, where's your faith? Now he's not talking again about, why didn't you calm the storm? He's like, why don't you trust me? And this is kind of where I think he's getting that. If there was that bad of a storm, and I've said this before, he probably woke up five or six times and rolled over and went back to sleep. There's no way he slept through that. I mean, unless he's like, Reagan. She sleeps through everything. (laughs) But, But honestly, there's no way he slept through this storm. I'm sure he woke up, heard it. He's like, oh, it's raining. And rolled over and went back to sleep, you know? I'm sure it woke him up, but then they come downstairs and, or wherever he's at, and they're like, hey, you don't care about us. We're, we're getting ready to die. What's going on? And he's like, you don't trust me? Why is he saying that? Listen, if God's asleep on the boat, then it's going to be okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, if Jesus is asleep on the boat, you know God didn't become flesh so he could come down and get killed by a storm. Okay. If Jesus is on the boat asleep, let him sleep and relax. Maybe you should go to sleep too. (laughs) Honestly. So both of these stories really tell of a a lack of trust in God and a lack of reliance in God's power and God's strength and, and God's ability and instead relying on our own. So when we're talking about changing our attitude in prayer. If you even think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was praying and he was, it says he was in such agony that his his sweat was dripping out like blood. And he's going, if you read it, it's just one verse, but I promise it lasted longer than that. He's like, if it's possible, please, Father, take this cup away from me. Now, I guarantee you that prayer lasted longer than just that one sentence. He was, because it said he was in agony. I mean, have you ever sweated blood and just said that once? You said something like that once? No, he's, he's in the garden going, God, I don't know if I can do this. Father, please help me here. I, is there another way? Is there something else we could do? Because I don't know if I want to go through this. But then he says, not my will, but your will be done. That's faith. What did he do? He gave up. (laughs) He surrendered. Jesus had faith? Yeah. 
in the Father. He trusted the Father. He's not gonna follow someone, repeat, repeat after someone, do what somebody else does if he doesn't trust them. He trusted the Father completely. And at the end of this prayer, he reaches this point where he just gives up, surrenders, and he's like, I don't want my will. I want yours. That's faith. Have you ever gotten to that point in prayer where you're praying, you're, you're going through something difficult, and you're praying, you're praying, you're praying, you're praying, you're telling God, you're venting to him, you're complaining to him, whatever you gotta do to get it out of your system. Have you ever gotten to that point where you're just like, I give up, not my will. I want yours. I trust you. I trust you, God. I know I don't have the answers. I know I can't take care of this on my own. I trust you. You ever gotten to that point? He didn't stop praying, but he surrendered. Now to close this out, let's turn to John chapter 2. Have you been getting something today? John chapter 2, and I want to read verses 23 through 25. It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. This is, have you ever read this before? Or do you remember it, this moment? Just these three verses here are extremely sobering, because I want to tell you what was going on. They... These people, it says that they began to believe because they saw him doing signs. They began to believe in his name because of the signs that he was doing. But then after that, it says, but Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew. He knew what would happen. He knew they would reject him. He knew they would deny him. He knew they wouldn't commit themselves to him. How did he know that? Because if you, if you look at these people believing in his name because of these signs, we might, first of all, believe that, well, that, that means they became Christians. They, they believed right there. They became Christians. They became believers. They were believing, right? But the thing is, they weren't they, they may have been believing in him because of these signs, but they did not have faith in him. And Jesus could see that. He could sense that. He could feel it. And whenever it says that he didn't entrust himself to them, you're not going to like this. This word entrust means believe. So it says they began to believe because of the signs he was doing, but he didn't believe in them. They began to believe because of the signs they saw him doing, but he did not believe them. He, he didn't, he knew. He was like, this isn't real. It's not something that's going to last. And in the same way, we have to make sure, I've, I've mentioned this a lot recently, but we have to make sure if we're putting on conferences where hundreds or thousands of people are getting saved just so we can tout around a number that we got this many people saved, but we have no idea what has happened, it could be like what, we, what Jesus was experiencing right here where in the moment they believe, but they're gonna walk away not having any faith, not having committed themselves to Jesus just, just because they saw something amazing, they heard something amazing, they felt something Something amazing, and it was, a, it was, but it was just a momentary thing. And this is what Jesus was sensing in them. This is why you can pretty much ask anybody today, "Hey, do you believe in God?" And they will say, "Yeah," because everybody believes in Him. Everybody believe. I'm not saying everybody. It's kind of a lot worse now than it used to be. It used to be everybody. Now it's like maybe 75 percent, maybe less. I don't know trying to keep myself from making bad comments about things. Uh, but 
when you ask somebody, most of the time, do you believe in God? Yeah, I go to church. Okay. Another thing that I like doing, an um, experiment that I like doing because I've fallen victim to it myself is you ask a minister, hey, when you don't know they're a minister or you don't know they're a pastor or whatever, and you ask them, hey, do you, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And their answer is, yeah, I'm the pastor at so-and-so church. Well, that doesn't have to do with your relationship with him. <laughs> you know? So I, that's another little experiment that I like. But this says, this is telling us, well, they believe now. Jesus is thinking they believe now, but what's gonna happen when they leave? How many people do you think, well, how many people do you know just from reading scripture saw Jesus perform signs, wonders, and miracles and still left? It's not enough. It's not enough to just believe. You have to have faith. You have to trust him. You have to surrender to him. Commit yourself to him. And what's really interesting is, you know, this ends chapter two, but if you go on in chapter three, verses one and two, actually we'll look at verses one through three, Right after this, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. He's like echoing exactly what Jesus just felt. We know you came from God because you can do signs. But then what does Jesus say? It's the most random thing Jesus could ever say, but it's not random at all. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So what is Jesus trying to say here? Why would he just throw that in there after <laughs> Nicodemus says, hey, we know you came from God because uh, you can do all these signs. We've seen you do signs. And Jesus is like, I know you've seen me do signs and you believe that I came from God. But if you want to see the kingdom, you have to commit yourself to me. You've seen signs, but if you want to see the kingdom, you need more than that. This is exactly what Jesus was feeling. <laughs> it's great that you've seen signs and you believe, but you need to see the kingdom, and for that you have to have faith. You need to be born again. So faith... I want us to get this because I do want us to change if we, if we are in the habit of feeling like when we're praying, it's, it's somehow, it's, it's, it's in a way we're partnering with God, obviously, in prayer, but it is not up to us. If it were up to us, Jesus could have said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And God would have been like, okay, yeah, we'll figure out another way. But when it all comes down to it, it all comes down to we need to make sure that what, when we're praying, it's not we're trying to make God do something that we want him to do. When we're praying, we're first and foremost trying to get his heart. And when we get his heart, then we can move out of the way and be like, okay, I understand now what you want. Let me change the way that I'm praying now. I trust you, God. I trust you and what you want. I trust your power and your ability and your strength above my own. So I'm not gonna sit here and try to obtain something that you, you are not ready to give or you don't want to give. Instead, I'm going to fully trust your will and, the, and your goodness to take care of this situation that I'm praying about. I'm gonna fully trust you. And I've gotten into this habit of whenever I'm praying for healing, I'm like not... You know, you, you kind of feel like when you're praying for healing, you like there's something even in your body that wants to push to make it happen. But, but even that kind of makes me feel weird because I don't need to make healing happen because it's been given to me. Why am I trying to make it happen? Instead, I just want to like surrender. <laughs> Wait, God, you've poured out healing? Well, let me just surrender to it. It's exactly what Pastor Rick prophesied today. <laughs> you've already poured it out? Well, okay. I just give myself to it. I don't need to make it happen. It's just here. It's just available. I trust you. Take me. Take me. Sometimes we're, we're instead, it's like God's coming up to us, laying down at the pool of Bethesda, and he's trying to help us up. But we're like, no, I want to do it. <laughs> 
right? So even in times like this, you come, if you come to church on Sunday to have your faith increased, it's not gonna happen through preaching, it's not gonna happen through prayer, it's not gonna happen through uh, somebody up here singing a song. I can increase your belief, but faith is up to you. I can convince you that this table is real, I can describe it to you, I can show you pictures, I can let you feel it, but the, but the faith, you have to increase that. And you increase your faith by decreasing yourself. I increase my faith when I decrease myself. I increase my faith when I choose to step back. And I promise you, if we would get this, then every single prayer that comes out of our mouth would be the most effective thing ever uttered on this earth. We would see, we would see signs and wonders and miracles. And I, I've said this before, we can't place faith in a miracle. We place faith in the miracle worker. We trust him. We don't trust the signs. We don't trust the wonders. We don't trust the miracles. We trust the wonder worker, the miracle working God. That is who we place our faith in, amen? So if you could stand with me, we're going to build our faith today on our own. I can't impart faith to you. It is something that you're gonna have to increase in yourself. And you do it not by, you're not gonna reach for faith. It's already inside of you. You've been given a measure of it. Now how is it gonna increase? You're gonna step out of God's way. Step out of his way. I trust you completely, God. I don't know what the outcome of this situation is. I don't know why I'm in this situation, but I trust you. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stop striving and trying to make something happen. Instead, I'm gonna let you work and I'm gonna let you be God. Can we do that today? Just close your eyes so we're not distracted, but begin to stir that up in you. It's not, it's not about calling faith to rise in you necessarily. It's saying, God, come be God. Jesus, come be King. Jesus, come be Lord. So can we do that even verbally today? With our mouths, begin to stir that up inside of ourselves. Begin to increase your faith. Yes, you believe, but let's have faith today. Everybody in here is facing something, right? If you're facing something, and you probably are, then let's just look at that thing and see God invading that thing. See him invading that thing, that situation. See him invading that sickness. Come on, let's stir it up. Let's just be verbal. God, we give you full charge today. We give you full authority. You have authority, but we give it to you in the way of not having it ourselves. We choose not to step in your way. We are partnering with you in this way by trusting you to take over. We are partnering with you in this way by trusting you to be in charge. We are partnering with you in this way by trusting you to lead us, to heal us, to provide for us. We don't just believe that you exist, God, but we have faith that you are going to to reward us if we diligently seek you. So we diligently seek you today with that full reliance and full faith. We choose not to lean on our own understanding, but we choose to lean on you in this time. We choose not to depend on what we know. We choose to depend, fully depend on you, God. We surrender to you. I know this may sound weird and maybe contrary to the faith movement's message or you know something like that that maybe we grew up in, but can we just tell God, I surrender, I give up? <laughs> Your will, God, not mine. I give up. I fully let down. I lay down. I'm given up. You are God. You are God. You are all powerful. You are all, you are all knowing. You are the strongest you are the most powerful. You are almighty. I give up, God. I give up my own way. I give up my own direction, my own desires, and I want yours, God. I trust you completely, 100%. Lord, I ask that that, that healing, I thank you that that healing that has been released in the atmosphere today is being brought to completion. I thank you that my shoulder is beginning to feel better. Lord, I thank you that, that anybody in here with a physical ailment of some kind, Lord, is beginning to experience the presence of God and, and, and in a way that brings them to fullness and to wholeness, their body to wholeness, so there's no more pain, there's no more issues, Lord. Any mental health problems, Lord, any trouble sleeping, Lord, I thank you for bringing healing to those and giving a, a good night's sleep to those who can't sleep. Lord, 
in the name of Jesus, we fully let down, we fully lay down, and we trust you completely. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org.